wired up. Yeah, the weather has cooled down a bit, right? You've got awesome. The, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I like it a lot. It's football weather. Then again, I've never been to Louisiana, so... Oh, that's hot as... That's hot as... We're not this weather here. Right. <laughs> but we thank you very much for showing up uh, at dinner time. This is an odd hour to have this event, but uh, we're, we're excited to have all of you here for this Kaiser Permanente sponsored event. And we want to all thrive in life, and that's one of Kaiser's mottos. And I will say, full disclosure, my favorite meals at one of my favorite restaurants in the Bay Area at the Boxing Room is the fried gator, the fried catfish, the hush puppies. <laughs> and, and so, it's all healthy. And, and I should stop right there. <laughs> Keep up with keeping guys in business. You like fried food. food. <laughs> that's a, that's a good, I, yes, that's a very good point. We're helping there. <laughs> and we are helping the cause. But this is going to be unique. I'm going to learn a whole lot. I think we all are about healthier Creole Cajun style cooking. And uh, that's why I, I want to introduce a wonderful chef because I've been to his restaurant many, many times. It's located at 399 Grove, uh, Grove at Goff, correct? That's correct. Okay. And it's centrally located to all these amazing places, yeah. SF Symphony, uh, the new SF Jazz Center, the Opera House. Uh, you, you've got everything right there. And it, it is a beautiful, wonderful place. And uh, without further ado, Chef Justin Simoneau. Yay. How are you guys doing this evening? Good. Good. Um, so, like you said, my name is Justin Simino. I'm from Louisiana and uh, got the opportunity a few years ago to cook the food from my home state here in San Francisco. Um, but we've taken some of the traditions of Louisiana and some of the great offerings that we have here in the Bay Area and kind of coupled those things in a lot of the dishes. And we're going to do a great example of that today. Um, I'd really appreciate it if you didn't tell any of my Louisiana friends I'm making a vegetarian gumbo. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to do it anyway. It's going to be great. We're going to use a few different things to kind of um, imitate the flavor and textures of meat in it, but it's going to be completely uh, actually accidentally vegan. Um, we're we're, we're wow. going here. I left the butter at home, so we got oh. all, so it's actually going to be vegan. Um, um, but well, I guess we'll just get right into it, um, unless you have any questions. Pre, before I start. No? Well, your, right. your name is French. Yes, that's, so i got one thing going for me, right? <laughs> um, so first off, what we're going to do back here, I think you all can see the spot here on the screens up there. Yeah. Um, I think one of the biggest things that happens when we cook at home is um, try to rush things, right? This is the most important step right here, is getting our pans hot. If you don't get your pan hot, your things stick to the pan. They soak up a lot more of the oil or the fat that you're starting to cook with. Um, so we want to make sure we really get a nice hot pan um, and the oil or the fat that you're using to cook as well. So we're using just a blend of canola and olive oil um, for this. Um, and then the first three ingredients that are going to go into the pot, um, onion, celery, and bell pepper essential to pretty much every single Louisiana dish there is. In Louisiana we call it the Holy Trinity. Um, and it is literally, when I'm at the restaurant prepping, I look at the stove starting off four or five different dishes and I have the same exact thing in all four or five pans. And I'm like, what? Which one goes where? But then, you know, the layers and the things that you do throughout changes it dramatically whenever you're going through this process. Um, but these three ingredients, and sometimes red bell pepper, I like to use a lot of red bell pepper as well. Um, really make Louisiana cooking what it is. I feel so strongly about it. I actually have a whole entire tattoo here that says Believe in the Trinity and it, all the vegetables tattooed on my arm there. Um, so you probably can't see from the screen, but you'll start seeing the oil kind of move around and at that point you know you've got your pan hot enough. Um, so first we're going to add the onions. You should hear a sizzle. Hopefully it's, I'm not lying to you about the heat. There we go. Um, let the onions go for a little while. I always um, like to just kind of let those guys start cooking first. They kind of, as you let onions cook, they really start letting out their sugars and get a nice sweet, caramely flavor going on. Um, 
again, time, patience. Usually if you don't have time, you're very impatient. Or even if we do have time, we're still impatient. So <laughs> anything that we're cooking, especially if it's from Louisiana, pop open a beer, glass of wine, put on some music, have a friend over, and just forget about things sometimes while you're doing it. Um, while we're forgetting about those onions, I'm going to go uh, through an important step of cutting a bell pepper, which I think a lot of people don't do, um, and can change the flavor dramatically. So the way I've cut it, I've kind of left all the pit, right? This pit is very bitter if you cook with this. You get, a, you get some almost tannic-like flavors that come out of your product, which you don't really want. It may be very subtle, but when you taste it with and you taste it without, you notice a lot in the end product. So when we get our nice cuts out there, just go through. Even the ribs that are left here, you want to make sure you take all of that out. You don't want to see any white in your bell peppers. And that goes for most, most any chilies. It has um, a lot of the bitter qualities to a pepper is in that pit. So we really don't want to, we don't want to add that to anything that we're making. Uh, so we go ahead and discard all those peppers. Um, and then we just go ahead and dice these up. Dice them up wherever you like. Perfect little squares is fine if you want to kill yourself over that. But you know what? We're going to cook this down to where it's nice and soft so no one will really care what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell any of my cooks that said that. <laughs> I'll show you lots of secrets tonight. So. Right. Chef, with a spicier pepper, would, would that membrane actually have more heat to it? It does. That is, that's another misconception where everyone says, oh, the seeds contain all the heat, right? It's actually in that pit. So they're together, so you kind of mistaken one for the other. But um, it still contains a lot of that bitter quality. So um, if you're going to use a jalapeno, you might lose a little of the spice. Just add a little more in there if you like. So we got those kind of see some caramelization happening around the edge of the pan there. We're going to go ahead and add the rest of our trinity, celery and bell peppers. Jeff, I know everybody with a French last name that's from southern Louisiana can cook, but do you have a background in, I mean, is, is your family, are they chefs? No one professionally. Everyone's a self-appointed chef in Louisiana. Everyone has their own way of doing it. Um, so it's, it's, everyone's very proud about what they do. Um, but as far as professionally, no one, no one does. I'm the first. Um, and you know, even, even as much support I have for my family, I've changed some of their recipes, and they don't like those very much either. <laughs> <laughs> so we got these, this Trinity going real nice. Just want to get these things stirred around. So the recipe you have in front of you says, saute the veg five or so minutes, or until the veggies start to wilt and get tender. That's the most important part. Remember every time you read a recipe, always remember this. Even recipes I write for myself, they're only guidelines. They're meant there for you to remember what goes in the pot. Quantities are really up to you, depending on your flavor, your, you know, your uh, opinion and things like that. Cooking times, the fire that I have right here is not exactly the fire you have whenever you start to cook this recipe at home. It's all about the final product and what textures and what we're trying to see. And what we're trying to see is translucent in the onions, wilting in the celery, and, and bell pepper. So use five minutes as a guideline, not a specific. Don't say you have time right now, and then five minutes, put in the next thing. We're going to wait till we get some nice, nice wilting happening. And that's going to really allow for la layers of flavors to happen. <laughs> Sorry, but real quick, uh, chef, do you source locally in terms of when I can? You know, I mean, if if I were to get locally sourced organic onions, I'd have to charge you forty-five dollars for a cup of this. So I do it when I can. You know, I get it. Being from California, pretty much everything is local. We grow majority of the country's uh, product, but yes, yeah, so I can attest for the carrots, the squash, the kale, the mushrooms, things that we're going to highlight, not the nuts and bolts so much. In the summertime, yes, I'm getting peppers from the local guys, um, celery from the local people sometimes. Just uh, we do it when we can, and we take great pride in that. Um, so when you're also wilting or cooking vegetables, it's always nice to season as you go. Salt, as you know, is a, extracts liquid from, from anything, really, meat, vegetables, whatever. So this is going to help this wilting process go a little quicker. So I know I put the salt at the end of the thing, of the recipe, and I think I recommend you add it when we add the rice towards the end, but add a little of that as you're going. Uh, season in layers just as you're trying to create these layers of flavor. Don't just season the outside, season it all the way through, you know what I mean? Chef, you do a lot of farmer, farmer's market 
shopping at all? I know that Kaiser Permanente right outside on Wednesdays from 10 to 2 has a nice farmer's market that I've been to a number of times. Um, you know, I used to do a lot more than I do now, but what that has caused, I've, pro I've created great relationships with lots of farmers that will now bring the product to me. So I don't necessarily have to go and fight all the baby strollers. I can just call them up and they'll bring it to me instead. Although it is nice to go from time to time and see what's, seems like they always put their best foot forward for the farmer's markets and if something just came into season yesterday, they're going to bring those to the market. That means I'm going to wait a week so it's fully ripened. So it's a, it's a nice tall tale sign of what's going on. Um, but I do, but I do it without going there. Got it. Actually, this Saturday I'm doing an event with Marin Organics and the Marin Farmers Market paired with Star Up Farms that are just on Bolinas, um, highlighting, I'm making a squash soup, highlighting all of their veggies that's going on right now. So we definitely support them as much as we possibly can. They do most of the hard work for us, the farmers. I mean, the quality of product here is unparalleled. And they make our jobs really, really easy as chefs, um, as far as growing great product. So we're starting to see that wilting happening here. I start seeing through some of the onions. Um, the next important part is adding the garlic. Um, and we're going to let that kind of bloom open and, and cook down as well. Jeff, do you have a signature dish? I mean, I do love the fried gator. I know it's not the healthiest thing in the world, but it is quite tasty and very tender. Um, we have this section on the menu called Classic Louisiana, and I think that's that's kind of our... That whole section is kind of our uh, staples, if you would. The duck and sausage jambalaya that we do on the menu has been there since day one. Some writers have said it's Best thing, one of the best dishes in San Francisco, must eat before you die type of thing. Um, the gumbo I take great pride in. Um, but then also all of the seasonal items that we do. We, when we're coupling seasonality with some of the techniques and ideas from the South, is I try to think of everything on the menu as being a staple and not paying attention. Too much attention to one thing and making sure everything is just equally as good. I almost forgot to mention the oysters too because... Oh, we have a lot of those. Yeah, we have a raw bar, we do usually have three or four, sometimes up to six different varieties of raw oysters, and then we do our, um, which is a pretty good staple, our charbroiled oysters that are, um, you know, slathered in garlic and cheesy, buttery goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of guys shut up. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so we're just going to let that saute for a little bit longer. Um, I'll skip forward a bit um, to an ingredient we're going to live, uh, add in a bit later. So we're adding some kale. Um, really important with kale is, I'm sure most of you already know, is taking this rib out. But what I wanted to more so mention, if you, again like I said before, uh, recipes are just guidelines, right? If you want to use chard, go ahead. One thing great about like a vegetable or green like chard is, the stem is very, very delicious in chard. A lot of people just toss it out. But in this instance, I would chop up the stems and add it in right now. I make, a lot of times if I have chard in a dish at the boxing room, you'll notice some sort of relish or some sort of garnish on top. I've cooked down the chard stems, mixed some sugar and vinegar in, made like a compote or something out of the stem. So there's lots of different greens and stuff that you can use um, parts of that you wouldn't normally do. Like if you get beets, use the beet greens, beet stems. I treat them just like chard. Um, these, unfortunately, when you cook them down, they still maintain their woody texture and they're not that pleasant. So. Not always does it work in your benefit, but sometimes it can. So just try it once, try it twice. If you don't like it, at least you tried, right? So we're looking pretty good here. We got a nice little color going on. I uh, got some nice flavor. You can kind of, I don't know what you can smell out there, but it smells pretty good back here. Um, we're going to add the tomato paste in. An important note about adding the tomato paste in this pretty much automatically turns it into a Creole dish. So the big difference between Cajun and Creole is the use of tomato products in any way, shape, or form and using liquor and cream. Cajun country, we kept our milk for drinking, we kept our liquor for drinking, and we didn't put a lot of tomato in it. There wasn't a lot of Spanish influence in the southern, southern deep roots of, um, of Louisiana, but in New Orleans there was a huge Spanish um, population that took over for a while. And this, 
this dish, jambalaya, was more so created in New Orleans as a spin-off of paella. A lot of times you have your seafood, you have your sausage, your pork products, and it's cooked down with rice, just as you would see a paella, or at least similar. Um, in, the, in the country, we kind of changed it a little bit, didn't have tomato product for some odd reason, probably because it cost a lot to cook grow tomatoes and get them down to the point where you get a little bit of paste. We just like the raw tomato as it was. Um, so by adding this, like, like I said, it pretty much turned it into a Creole one. The reason why I decided to do that is because we don't have all the pork products or smokiness or just adds another depth, another layer of flavor that's going to help this um, jambalaya have some really great flavor. Cooking the rice at this point as well, chef. Is that correct? No, we're going to cook it all together. Cook it all together. Yeah, that's another great thing about most Louisiana things. It's a one-pot wonder. Wow. A lot of things are meant to be. You know, you had a lot of work to do out in the yard, a lot of work to do out wherever you are. Um, so things that you could start, put a lid on, simmer it, and walk away from it was great. I mean, that's why the big tradition of Red beans on Monday came about. It was always laundry day on Mondays. And beans, they take 10, 10 hours or so if you're simmering the whole entire time without soaking them. So put them on in the morning. Everyone's outside washing clothes, doing their thing. Come back and even dinner's ready. One pot. Only had to clean one pot at the end of the day. That's also uh, something great when you're cooking at home. Less things you gotta wash, it's, it's always better. I kind of forget that sometimes. My wife and I go out and shop for dinner. Come home and try to cook like we cook at the restaurant. We're like, I have the dishwashers at home. <laughs> last, last question, real quick. Don't make it the last question. I mean, the last question for the next question. Sorry. Um, how long have you been at the boxing room for? Uh, at the boxing room, let's see. We turned three in June. So that's. A little over three years, but I was uh, lucky enough to be part of the, the pre-team, if you would, that helped with a lot of design and conceptual. So I've been working on box room for a little over four years now, probably. Yeah. All right. So at this point, we're going to add all of our uh, vegetables that make this thing fall: the carrots, put in our squash. Uh, we got cremini mushrooms. If you want to. Substitute anything, you want to use some pumpkin, you want to use some turnip rutabaga, or maybe lessen the amounts of all of these and add a combination of all that stuff, go ahead and do that, whatever you like. You want to use some fancier mushrooms like cremini's and then like uh, chanterelles or something, that's fine too. But these little guys are so underrated for being delicious and just soaking up so much flavor. Um, I like to utilize them a lot. Really pretty. This is a great time of year because um, you're having the ending of summer happening, the beginning of fall. There's so many beautiful colors out there. It's pretty. It's pretty amazing. Is this a recipe that's on your menu? Uh, this is not. No, this is one that I came up with especially for y'all. <laughs> yeah. You feel special. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> uh, this time is where we're going to add our flavorings. Uh, we got some dry thyme. Uh, we got some Cajun or Creole seasoning that we have here. Basically, it's a mixture of paprika, a little bit of cayenne, some onion powder, garlic powder, dried oregano. Um, if you, I make my own at the restaurant. If you buy some at the store, be careful about the amount of salt that's in these pre-made spices mixtures, because that can really, really affect the way you're going. If you're following that recipe, and you had the recommended amount of salt, you might find your dish being overly salted, and that's as well true when we get to the stock portion. If you're ever buying stocks instead of making your own, always try to buy the low sodium ones. That way it doesn't really affect your recipe that much. Anything less salt is healthy, right? That's a good point. Drive. Drive. Now I love your hot sauce from at the boxing room. Is that you source that from where it doesn't have any name on the bottle? It's just a red bottle of wonderful tasting hot sauce that gives me a nice endorphin rush every time I go there. <laughs> so it all depends on what time of year you come in. I have to be honest and say we do make it in-house, but we can only make so much because this year, um, let's see, I got 
I think I did 500 pounds of peppers, which gave me about 60 gallons of hot sauce. Mm. Double from last year, 30 gallons only left. I thought it was going to last this. Like, oh, I'm going to get through six, seven months with this. It lasted two. People were <laughs> like you, probably. You'd have one yeah, of the I, 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 I didn't pocket any of them. I might have used the whole one. <laughs> um, but right now, we just, uh, two weeks ago, we just, we just released, if you would, released um, our this year's hot sauce, which is a mixture of jalapenos and paprikas from our buddy Toby at Free Spirit Farms. Uh, we, we do a fermented cell hot sauce, so it's got a nice little funk on it, fermented for a month. Then we cook it down with garlic and vinegar. Um, I'm kind of kicking myself right now that I didn't bring any. Um, and then we just let it mellow out for a little bit and then put it on the tables. Actually, this year I got my hands on a whiskey barrel and I'm aging some for a year in a whiskey barrel. Wow. So next year we'll have two different hot sauces. So at this stage of this, at least this dish, we want to just keep stirring this around. Uh, things are getting pretty cooked down. Things are starting to stick to the bottom of the pot a little bit, which is not necessarily a bad thing when you're making jambalaya because that's where a lot of the color comes from. Uh, if you read some like real old Cajun guys' recipes, they like the first three steps would be adding in sausage, basically burning it, taking it out, putting in chicken, burning it, taking it out, putting in pork, burning it, taking it out, and that's where you get your Cajun like brown, like really brown jumbo, uh, jambalaya color from. It. Um, so it's not, not a horrible thing, as long as it's not black and it stays nice and, I don't know if you can see that color up there, but it's starting to get nice and brown and you really get that caramely flavor. It's, it's quite okay at this point. You traditionally use a lot of vegetables in your jambalaya, even though standard jambalaya, as you've mentioned, has shrimp and chicken. Right. Pork sausage, but you do use a ton of vegetables, so I just want to mention I, that to everybody. I do. Even in the even in the one that wouldn't be just a, a vegetarian gumbo. I mean, or jumbo, I keep saying gumbo. Jambalaya. <laughs> I I personally like to add a lot more of the Trinity. I think the flavor that it gets just it just really helps have a real well balanced flavored dish, opposed to it just tasting like meat and rice. Um, so it's my preference. Um, make it however you like end of the day. Um, so another kind of untraditional thing that we're going to do, at least if you're going by Louisiana standards, is using brown rice. Um, I personally, I, I do use brown rice at the restaurant. I really enjoy the flavor, the texture, the benefits of brown rice. Um, I'll explain all that after we add this and put a lid on it. It's pretty much done at that point. So we're using veg stock here. You can use either veg stock, mushroom stock, I wouldn't recommend using just water, but you can if you want. My mother didn't use just water for lots of things for a very long time. So I went to culinary school and said, hey, there's a thing called stocking oil. <laughs> uh, so I recommend it. Even, you know, even the, there's lots of nice carton type stocks you can buy at the stores now that are sourced or made locally and, and at least organic. Or um, There's some more thought being put into it. It's not just your really weird yellow canned stuff that has a ton of salt in it anymore. Um, so brown rice, for me, texture, nice kind of chewy texture to it, has a nutty, really nice nutty flavor that I think matches a lot of the um, flavors of Louisiana cooking, you know, a lot of things are roux based, you get this really nice dark roux that kind of has this nice nutty flavor. At the restaurant, anything that's stewy, we offer your, you have your choice of brown or white rice, whichever one you prefer. And then, also brown rice is just has a whole lot more nutrients, right? I mean, it's only it's only had the hull taken off of the rice grain. The white rice that we see a lot, long grain rice, has had the hull taken off, had the bran taken off, germ taken off, and then polished to oblivion to be attractive, whatever attractive means. So we come up with this just, you know, we all know white rice. But what this has in it, compared to what that has in it, Flavor and texture, usually health and flavor and texture don't go hand in hand, but in this case it really, really does. And I, I take great pride in it. We use a local company called Masa Organics. They make some of the best brown rice that I've found. I have got introduced to it a few years ago and I haven't looked back there ever since. It tastes, they have a stand at the farmer's market and they're getting a little more wide out. I think you can find it in some of the specialty stores. I think I've seen it at Buy Right Market has it. Um, I don't know about Whole Foods or anything. Rainbow has it for sure. Um, they're really, it's literally probably the best 
brown rice out there at the moment. So this is another part where patience comes into play. <laughs> we got to stare at this pot for 30 minutes without opening the lid. <laughs> yes. Can we come back um, later then? She asked first. Let's go. With, let's go with this one. Um, if you wanna cook with uh, shrimp and chicken and, or sausage, where should I put those ingredients? So when we were so before before we added the training in the pot, we'd get the oil hot. We'd brown our chicken, put it out. We'd brown our shrimp, take it out, and then start the process. For the chicken, it takes a little longer to cook than the shrimp, so we put that in as we did. Uh, let's say at the same time, put the rice in. We'd do that, and then if you're cooking seafood, you can cheat 15 or 20 minutes into it, pop the lid, and throw your shrimp in there. That way, everything's cooking nicely. You can add it all in at the beginning, but then you're going to get. I mean, the amount of time a shrimp takes to cook in a piece of chicken, you're going to have this chewy, dry, kind of chalky shrimp, and maybe this beautifully cooked chicken. So, um, just being being, um, know, just knowing when things, how long do things take to cook are great, but I always suggest browning things before, and then we're going to get a nice fondant at the bottom of the pan that's going to give us a lot of flavor as we add liquid, all that's going to get released and mixed in with the rice, so you're going to get a lot of that nice deep brown flavor from it. And then when everything is red, I, mean, I put with the rice, mm -hmm. everything? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and you just let it go, and like I said, it's really hard to cook rice and not want to... Mm -hmm. What's going on? But also with the jambalaya, it's a little bit forgiving. I mean, you can stir it up like a risotto if you like and cook it that way. Um, but I, I suggest just rice has been being cooked for a long time a certain way. There's no need to mess with it. Thank you. You're welcome. What were you saying? No, um, I was saying if it's going to take 30 minutes, we can come back in 30 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you can, but I, TV magic. <laughs> <laughs> you can come back in 30 minutes, it might be gone. Yeah, this one will be ready. <laughs> oh, oh, do you have some already cooked? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. I told you I was going to tell you secrets. Yeah. <laughs> oh. um, so, I'm seriously, guys, I don't know, maybe a, was that a little short? No, you were fine. Okay. 27 okay. minutes. Well, I'll ask you a question. Yeah. Perfect. Where does the... Oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Um, it seems like kale has just become popular relatively recently. What has True. caused that popularity? I think just any trends, really. Um, it's easy to grow. It's not that expensive. I'd be the two honest points. And then there's a lot of doctors and stuff that came out with studies of its health benefits. It's very versatile. You can dry it, make chips out of it. You can cook it down. You can saute, you can saute it. We do a raw kale salad at the restaurant. So I think it's versatility, it's health factors, and the fact that it grows really easily. It's very, very, um, for almost every farm list that I see, from all the way down Southern California up to the Oregon border, grows kale. Like, it's just really easy to grow. I think that has a lot to do with it. It's, it's accessibility and it's versatility. Mm -hmm. Is it good for drought season? Like, does it grow through droughts and stuff? I don't think anything too happy at the moment, but um, it can it can withstand some drought. I'm not an expert, so yeah. don't quote me on that, but it's still being grown right now. Yeah. Yeah. I have two questions. The first yeah. is where do you get your gator from? Uh, the gator comes from Louisiana. Um, this farm in this town called Riceland, which is probably about two and a half hours southwest of um, New Orleans. Um, if I had it my way, I'd get wild gator, but California has a weird thing about allowing uh, lots of wild game into into California and sell it from other states. Um, like we can't really get Louisiana oysters out here. We can't get a lot of the wild game. I mean, let me get wild crawfish, but not wild gator. Not exactly sure why those things are, but I do get it from a farm uh, in that town outside of, outside of New Orleans. My other question was, um, I'm a little naive. Uh, gumbo is basically a stew or a soup, so there's not rice added to it to cook it. So if we were, to, we'd almost do the same process. We would, but we would first start with uh, of making a roux, so some water I and mean then some oil. If you're making a Creole or New Orleans style one, you start with butter, then you add flour, and you cook that down till it's darker than this. But uh, we would target for that color, and then we would do the same process. You add the Trinity, cook that down, put your herbs and spices, the stock. And then separately you steam your rice and you just add a little scoop of rice on top of it. So you just have this nice thickened stewy soup, if you would. Yeah. Any other questions out there? How do 
think they should ship the alligator to you? Is it all in one? <laughs> <laughs> it comes in live, there's some cages, and I gotta go out back and press them up. No, they, they have a wonderful uh, processing facilities down there that process it to my specs and cryo back in bags, freeze it, and ship it out to us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can eat the whole thing, but we prefer the tail for what we do with it. We fry it, so the tail is the, is the best for that. If you get into the legs and stuff like that, it's great for making stews and cooking down. Um, I mean, just think of, I guess you can't really think of anything because it doesn't have a big tail like this. That you need. Um, but tail is preferred for what we're doing. Yeah. What's your favorite restaurant in New Orleans? In New Orleans. My favorite restaurant at the moment would probably be Cochon. Um, this chef, Donald Link, is a really big, I've never got to work with him, but I've followed him since he's been living, he lived out here for a long time from a little town, kind of similar to my story, although he's, he's way up here, um, I'm trying to get to him, but uh, he came out here, cooked in some high-end restaurants out here for a long time, and went back and really turned the ones on its head in the sense of breaking the tradition of the old school restaurants and bringing a Cajun flair to New Orleans and showing a little side of the country and the depth and the and the history of what it was. So Cochon is, I haven't been to his new restaurant called Peche, which is based around the same ideas, but, but seafood. And I heard it's the same, so I, I would almost throw that in my, one of my favorites without ever really trying it, just knowing knowing him, um, or at least his abilities. But Cochon is probably my top restaurant right now. So my question to you is, you know, oversaturation of cookbooks out there, mm -hmm. that's what's missing is a, a Louisiana, a New Orleans sort of cooking. Yeah, book. you're not. You're, you're not. There's a lot of them out there, but they're pretty. Not, not all of them are very good. Um, but speaking again, um, I'm not here to be an ambassador for Donald Link by any means. But his cookbook, Real Cajun, is it's kind of like my Bible. Or if there's another one, this chef called John Falls. He's a really he's owned a cooking school for a very long time in uh, this little town called Thibodeau. Uh, down in southern Louisiana, and he has this book called The Encyclopedia of Cajun Creole Cooking. It is literally the probably the most informative cookbook that you can get about why things are the way they are and how to get them in your kitchen. And it's it's this big, it's massive, but it's it's really good. Those two are I probably have 50 Louisiana cookbooks, and I I those are murdered, stained up, spines ripped off. Like I use them a lot. Or at least have in the past before I started coming to my own recipes here. The box room is very unique, so it, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, my brother lived for eight years in, in Slidell, so mm -hmm. um, visiting him, we go to different places, and it's very, very distinct in flavor. The boxing room, you can almost isolate the flavors from different parts of, of Louisiana, but it's, you know, people can pick up a book, sure. right? But it's not going to be the same because, um, I think a lot of those books are written in an old, old-fashioned style. True. And things have changed so much where, you know, our palates have changed. We're now at a higher level of eating now. You know, people are not content with just a fast food burger and right. you know, want something that's a little more higher up. So, yeah, box room is very unique, and I think that, you know, maybe having a, a small book even that just kind of pokes at. Well, we'll we'll take the, we'll take your suggestion of making a book, and uh, we'll we'll have a meeting with with, with the boss man next week and see where we go with that. It's not a bad idea, actually. I haven't thought of that one yet. Yeah. You mentioned oysters, fried oysters mm -hmm. before. Are you anticipating having trouble getting oysters now that Drake's Bay um, oysters closing down? Or are uh, no, services? no, not really. I mean, the West Coast oyster cultiv cultivation is so mass. I mean, as, as such a large part of what Drake's Bay did for us um, in their in the scope of oysters available, it, it's it's a small part of it, but their presence and their ideas and their community, their community um, presence was what made Trakes Bay so special. Um, so getting oysters out there closed, no, there's plenty of farms um, all the way up to British Columbia, all the way down to Mexico now that provided a lot of oysters, um, but we'll never have people that care or the same relationship with the oyster farmers, I don't think then you can have with those two people because they were pretty special. And it is a very sad, sad thing. Yeah. 
Can I ask you a question? Yes. I rushed the stage. Did you notice? <laughs> yeah. Good job, Earl. Weren't you telling people earlier to watch your own? I have two real quick. Have you ever heard of jebelai being crunchy, where you cook the rice, where it's kind of like paellas, where I guess they're there are, in fact, crunchy paellas. I mean, I, I have heard of this. I know I've been laughed out of the room for asking this before, but have you heard I of that? I'd say that's just some Louisiana guy being real proud that he burnt his own burnt it. Burnt it. <laughs> <laughs> So that's sure, the way it's supposed to be. Sure, that's what it was. Okay. Oh, this is the crunchy kind I made today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my second question is, uh, as a Louisiana native, does Emerald make you cringe? You know what? There, so certain people that can make you cringe also can do a great deal for our community. And what he did for New Orleans, I mean, he was a commander chef before I even can, probably before I was one. But anyway, we won't go there. But, the show, the bam, the thing, all that stuff, yes, it makes me cringe, but what I think he originally sought out to do for New Orleans and being a part of the culinary scene in New Orleans, he, there's no one can take that away from him. <coughs> what's, the, what's the book you have to have um, if you're new to Cajun Creole cooking or one or the other? What's What would be a book that everybody should The encyclopedia. If you're, if you're trying to get an idea of... The country part of Louisiana, I say real Cajun, is the best one to get. Real Cajun? It's called real Cajun. Yeah. Now, it won, it won, um, what's that guy I knew the awards people with for fresh on stuff? John Black. Anyway, it's great. No, well, he's good too. But he has, John Besh takes a real germ, Germanic approach to Louisiana food. He's from a German background, so there's lots of meat and potatoes, which it's also what makes Louisiana cooking and New Orleans cooking so special. There's been so many people that have just piled their thoughts and processes into what we do. It's, okay. You need to put this on your menu. Oh, thank you. That is delicious. Yeah. With side of you here? Uh, hot sauce in it? I put a little cayenne and then our house made Creole season in there. So it's got a little kick going on there, yeah. Yeah, I like my food kind of hot. Is it too much to it? Okay. I can make a little <laughs> Like I said, I was kicking myself really for not bringing I can make a little more, yeah. <laughs> you know what else thinks great about making a dish like this is it can be your main attraction. You can also have something else going in the oven, nice big roasted fish or some, um, you know, pork or whatever. It can be your side dish, basically, is what I'm getting at. And it can be both your veg and your uh, starch all in one. So, it, Or it can just be that in a salad. That's you dinner. can eat it for days, even cold. It's better tomorrow. Yeah. I guarantee you it's better tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you, you are with me, Caesar, with Kaiser. Uh -huh. yeah. So, who is representing Kaiser? You? One of the weird things. Oh, left no. Left better than they needed. Yeah, it's definitely true on a lot of stuff. I don't think it was by design. It was more so by accident, but it works out well that way. Rice is really good. Again, the farmers made it real easy for me. I just. Do you know too if you hit them right at the holidays, they run geese through their fields and you can under the table buy nice. geese I from them. But it's not sure. It's a word of mouth thing you have to buy. I think a couple of you might know that. Buy geese under the table at Monso Organics. Not live, they're already. If you want it live, you can get them. Well, they can be one raw. No, no, no. 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 That, that has to be under the table, <laughs> especially in this state. We don't no, do but you can um, blow it up. Anyone else have any questions, comments, or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Quite that's a good cow. We have food in your face, so that's we're doing something. Oh, for the holidays coming. What do you do special for Thanksgiving if you're open or before? Uh, we're not open for Thanksgiving, but leading up to Thanksgiving, we will definitely do some. So we have a thing called a boucherie every night, which is basically a whole animal preparation. It's a really special thing that we do in Louisiana where uh, everyone gets together. Usually it's based on a hog, slaughter the hog. Every couple of different families take pieces away, cook them, come back in the evening and have a party, right? So we try to celebrate that, that boxing room and we get in, just today I got in a goat, next week I got in a pig. But to answer your question about the holidays, throughout Thanksgiving I'll get turkeys and I'll do um, you know, like a southern Thanksgiving style dinner for our boucherie at night. Yeah. So for those that want a real pecan pie, can we order a pecan pie from you during the holidays? <laughs> uh, you, you probably can, yeah. I know a guy that might make one or two. Yeah. 
Yeah. Now it's 24 hours. It's pretty much what we need. We can get you anything you want for sure. Good to know. No limitations. Good to know. Thank we you. had a long discussion about the confines. Yeah. Which is delicious. There. It's very delicious. As as your your cornbread is delicious too, by the way. So Thank you. I just want to mention that. Do you, do you make that yourself, or do you have a we pastry make, chef? No, we make that. We 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 make that. Yeah, uh, it's a pretty simple one. Just five things in a bowl and put them together. I try to dub that as much as I possibly can. <laughs> Less intimidating that way. What is the meaning of the name, the boxing room? Does um, that relate to Louisiana or does it? It doesn't really relate to Louisiana other than utilizing what you have in front of you, if you, if you want to think of it that way. We do that a lot in Louisiana, utilize what we have. Um, but the building itself was uh, called Sanders Shirt Factory in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and the room that we're in is where they actually box the shirts. Um, they also made Boss of the Road overalls. Um, so yeah, Shirt Factory turned restaurant 100 years later. Huh. Interesting. I thought it was... Well, yeah. yeah. It's funny, one of my friends when we first opened, like, I didn't really even know the meaning at that time either, but when we were talking about the name, he sends me a snapshot, he's at a estate sale, and this person had this amazing collection of antique boxing cards, like actual boxers on their little cards, and he's like, this would be great for your restaurant. I was like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> How much scale did you put in? Uh, that was just about, a, that was a bunch, one nice large bunch. It breaks down pretty It does. Yeah, you cook anything long enough, it'll go away. <laughs> you want some more, I have some right here. <laughs> yeah. So what's the difference to cook? Professionally or just Uh Let's see. Professionally, I moved here 10 years ago to go to culinary school. That's where I got my professional experience. Um, but. Like mentioned earlier, every single thing in Louisiana is surrounded by the kitchen. So at a very early age, I was in there, uh, chair turned backwards, standing right here, like, what's going on? Mom pushed me away, so don't burn my face. But it's a very, very early age. I think it's just embedded in you when you're from Louisiana. It's just cooking is like, that's the hero of the night. Like, when the food is ready, you're like, woo -hoo! okay, wait. So like, I wanted to be part of that. Um, Started making, as I mentioned to him earlier, I started making pecan pies for Thanksgiving at six, seven years old. Stirring gumbo is going on, we making it. So that's where the roots started, and then thought it was a no brainer to just go ahead and do this for a living. It's not very often you can do what you love for a living, so I feel pretty fortunate for that. Uh, Cochon is a French restaurant, isn't it? Cochon is a Cajun French restaurant, so it's, I mean, it's, it means pig, yes, but anything in Louisiana has some sort of French background to it, so. He's playing off of that. I mean, okay. if it wasn't for the no, French. No, because I saw. If it wasn't for the French kicking us out of France and then getting kicked out of Canada, Louisiana wouldn't be what it is today. <laughs> 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 History lesson. Yeah. Now, Cochon is on the French di directory, you know, so that's why. Um, yeah, now just look up, uh, I think it, the website is cochonnewarlands.com. Oh, okay. I'm sure they ran into that same issue whenever they tried to start advertising for their restaurant. Well, delicious. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thank you. And this is right. yeah. so, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was a unique experience. We learned a lot about healthier style Cajun Creole cooking, which was new to me because, like I said, my favorite stuff tend, tends to be deep fried at one of my favorite restaurants in the entire city. So, but, but uh, thank you all for coming down to Macy's, and we always want to thank Chef Justin Simon Simon. Thank you guys very much. Thank you.